Hey, my name's Pete, and uh, so glad that you're with us today. We're going to continue on in our uh, series on the Reformation, and uh, specifically finishing up this five-week journey through what are known as the five solas. And uh, this morning we, we look at the final one of the five, soli deo gloria, or to God alone be the glory. So um, you can turn in your Bibles to the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, if you've got a Bible with you. That's where we'll start this morning. And uh, one quick thought on the five solas as we kind of conclude this part of the series. Um, you may remember, when I was in high school, there was a movie that came out. Um, it was a dumb comedy called Airheads. And it had um, Brendan Fraser and Adam Sandler and Steve Buscemi. And they're in this 90s hair metal band called the Lone Rangers. Does anybody remember that? No. It's not a good movie, but for some reason, it was one of my favorites. And um, there's, their band's called the Lone Rangers, and there's this one scene where they're trying to get a record deal or something, and this record executive goes, um, how can you pluralize the Lone Rangers? And they're like, what do you mean? And he's like, there's three of you. You're not lone right? Like you should call yourselves the Three Rangers or something like that. And these guys don't get it at all. And I thought that was funny. Um, maybe you have a similar question related to the five solas. How can they all be alone if there's five of them? Um, some of you have actually asked this question, and I think it's interesting uh, that there's there's five different questions that are being addressed with these five Reformation declarations. And, uh, and so they can each stand alone because they're each answering different questions, right? So real quick to run through them, where is God's plan for salvation found? How do we know who God is and what he's up to to redeem the world? Scripture alone, right? So who is the one who saves us? Christ alone. How does God save us? Grace alone. What must we do to be saved? Faith alone. And then this morning, we'll look at the final question. What's the point of all of this? What's the point of God's story of unfolding grace and this invitation to salvation, to restoration, to reconciliation that we all have been uh, recipients of? What's the point of it all? And the answer is God's glory alone. And so in Isaiah 6, we get kind of this famous classic passage that's incredibly uh, beautiful and inspiring on one hand and really confusing uh, on the other hand. And so I won't be able to answer all your questions uh, this morning about Isaiah 6, but I want to just kind of share these first few verses and see what it is that uh, the Bible teaches about the glory of God. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. And so within this ancient Hebrew book of prophecy, we have this one little glimpse where Isaiah is describing for his readers this vision that God gave him. This sort of, we don't know exactly, sort of out-of-body experience or something like that, like this really vivid vision where he was all of a sudden kind of miraculously transported 
to the throne room of the king and creator of the universe. And in this vision, he sees all these kind of crazy where the wild things are sort of beings dancing around and flying around and declaring in verse 3, holy, 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 the Lord is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And so um, this is one of the classic uh, pictures in the scripture that helps us understand the concept of the glory of God, and we'll come back to it uh, in just a moment. The glory of God is a central theme throughout the scripture, and it was a central theme in the Protestant Reformation that we're celebrating the 500th anniversary of. And here's how I think about it, that there's part of us as human beings that simply wants to be wowed, if you will. There's something in us that wants to be thrilled or impressed. We have this like desire deep down inside of us. We're born into the world that we want to be amazed. We want to be wowed. And so when something happens in our life that seems like a big deal or when someone comes along in our life that thrills us or impresses us, it's like we wake up. It's like we feel alive or aware or human in a way that we normally don't. So what are, the, what are those things for you? I think we all have different ways that we pursue this desire to be woken up and to feel alive. Isn't this why we travel, for example? To go new places, to see new things, to meet new people, to have new experiences. We want to have this overwhelming sense of, of life or or awe or wonder as we take in these beautiful landscapes or pieces of architecture or history or art or whatever it is. This is why we travel. Isn't this why we entertain ourselves with movies and with TV shows or even with video games or with social media or whatever it is? We want so badly to connect our boring little lives to something that feels much more exciting something much more interesting. We want our story to connect to a more impressive, uh, more entertaining story. This is why we love sports. For those of us that are sports fans, we wait, you know, especially the Olympics or the Super Bowl or the World Series or whatever. There's something about these stories, these events, these kind of pinnacle moments of human achievement that wows us, impresses us, and inspires us. For others of us, this is why we read books. This is why we listen to music or go to concerts or go to art exhibits or museums or or whatever it is. We don't have to explain to anyone why we like those things or why we do those things or make sure to include them in our lives. We all understand this is just part of what it is to be human. We are drawn to that which is impressive which is inspiring, which is life-giving. And there's a million different places that we can go to pursue the fulfillment of those longings. And this is why we look forward to major life events, right? Why we celebrate things like getting engaged or getting married or graduating or getting a promotion or having that first kid or saying goodbye to that last kid, or retiring, or whatever it is, these kind of benchmark, land, uh, landmark occasions throughout life. We look forward to them, we anticipate them, we plan celebrations and parties, we budget for them, and we kind of measure life before and after these events. So our human experience is full of all these different ways that we are pursuing this desire that's built into us to be wowed, to be impressed, or to be amazed. And so life's amazing. Life's beautiful and full of wonderful moments and impressive people and places and things. And at the exact same time, we also know that at some point, the wow factor begins to wear off. At some point, the thing that we were looking forward to or moving towards or planning towards or the thing that we were ordering our life around to the place we were going to go to be wowed, at some point, it, at some point it gets ruined for us. 
or the luster begins to fade a little bit. Like we're so excited and that thing maybe works for a little while and then it wears off and then what? We're on to the next thing, right? We're on to the next thing. The thing that once was going to be the fulfillment of my dreams, everything that I've been working for, everything that I've been looking forward to, that thing that I now have achieved or experienced or whatever, now it's sort of old news and I'm on to the next and I'm on to the next and I'm on to the next. So things can be inspiring and impressive for a while, but they almost always wears off and we start looking for the next thing. And so if we're paying attention to our own hearts and if we're being honest with ourselves, then this cycle kind of describes so much of what it feels like to be human, right? That yes, life is amazing and beautiful and wonderful and there's so much good stuff every day. And at the same time, we almost live in this constant state of disappointment, of feeling unfulfilled, and frustrated, and like maybe just around the corner is the thing that we've been waiting for. C.S. Lewis writes about this famously in his book, The Weight of Glory, and I've got a a chunk that I want to read with you. But think about it through this lens of that desire for more and that kind of constant feeling that that we haven't quite found what we're looking for. He says, in speaking of this desire for our own far-off country, which we find in ourselves even now, I feel a a certain shyness. I'm almost committing an indecency. I'm trying to rip open the inconsolable secret in each of you, that secret which hurts so much that you take your revenge on it by calling it names like nostalgia and romanticism and adolescence. The secret also which pierces with such sweetness that when in intimate conversation the mention of it becomes imminent, we grow awkward and affect to laugh at ourselves. The secret we cannot hide and cannot tell though we desire to do both. We cannot tell it because it is a desire for something that that has never actually appeared in our experience. We cannot hide it because our experience is constantly suggesting it. And we betray ourselves like lovers at the mention of a name. Our commonest expedient is to call it beauty and behave as if that had settled the matter. The books or the music in which we thought the beauty was located will betray us if we look to them. It was not in them. It only came through them. And what came through them was longing. These things, the beauty, the memory of our own past, are good images of what we really desire. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols, breaking the hearts of their worshipers. For they are not the thing itself. They are only the scent of a flower we have not found, the echo of a tune we have not heard, news from a country we have never yet visited. A beautiful piece of writing which we start to connect with. That longing for the thing behind the thing. And we thought it was going to be that book, that trip, that person, that life event, that achievement, that benchmark, that promotion, whatever it was. And we end up heartbroken and disappointed again. That phrase, <clears throat> that these things, when we, when we mistake them for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols and break the hearts of their worshipers. It reminds me, this may be a little depressing, but we'll get to the good news in a moment. It's just going to get worse here for a second. Um, of a series of photographs that was done by a uh, somewhat controversial photographer named Dinah Goldstein uh, about 10 years ago now. And she did a series of photos called Fallen Princesses. And um, I've I've been intrigued by this series of photos for quite a while because there's something, 
that kind of messes with you when, when you look at these. And so for her, um, she's playing with the Disney stories that many of us grew up with. These stories that promised a life um, of happily ever after, right? And she, the photographer, got to this place in her life where her kids were being raised on these Disney-like stories where everything always works out. And then I believe either her or her mother got diagnosed with cancer. And her kids had no idea, they, they, weren't, they weren't equipped to deal with a tragedy like that when their imagination had only been shaped by happily ever after. And so what she does in this ph photography series is imagines what happens after the final credits roll in these Disney movies. And she does a whole series. I want to just show you four of them, and we'll spend a couple seconds on each of them. And so it's a Cinderella sitting in a dive bar somewhere in Idaho or something, right? <clears throat> and the narrative that Goldstein gives is that maybe she's uh, tried and tried to conceive and start a family, um, but instead finds herself alone and turns to the bottle. Right? Next one. <laughs> Snow White. <laughs> And the prince sits there with his beer, watching his sports, <laughs> and she's got her hands full. Next one. Not so little Red Riding Hood. Basket full of hamburgers and french fries. <clears throat> and then finally this one. Not as funny, huh? And so she's, in her statement, she says, this series creates metaphor out of the myths of fairy tales, forcing the viewer to contemplate real life, failed dreams, addiction, obesity, cancer, the extinction of indigenous culture, pollution, war, and the fallacy of chasing eternal youth. And by embracing the textures and colors created by Disney, which built a multi-billion dollar exploiting these fairy tales, these fallen princesses, exposed the consumerism that has negated the value of these ancient parables. Okay? So we're not bashing, bashing Disney necessarily, but you can see what she's doing, right? It's provocative and um, it's a fascinating series. But there's something that connects deep within us. Okay? Well, on one hand, life's amazing. And sometimes it does feel like we're living the dream, right? And we wake up in Bend, Oregon every day. That's incredible. And on the other hand, it's a broken world. And we're broken people. And there's pain and injustice and evil all around us and, and inside of us. And so on one hand, we're wowed and inspired, we're energized, and we're human. And on the other hand, we're constantly hurting constantly waiting, constantly looking and wishing. If you've been following in the news the story about the opioid crisis in our country, it's absolutely crushing. Um, opioids are killing 90 Americans every day. So for context, that means that this last year, more people died from opioid use and overuse than from car accidents. Okay, so this is now the leading, drug overdose is now the leading cause of death for Americans under the age of 50. What does it say about a society when its leading cause of death is overdosing on pain pills? You have a society that is deeply hurting, right? that is trying to deal with its brokenness, its disappointment, its emptiness, its sense of hopelessness or helplessness in any way that it can, and reaching for a bottle of Oxy or whatever's available at least helps for a moment. Helps escape, helps feel like we're actually alive and we're gonna make it. 
Okay, that's the depressing part. But it's the world we live in, right? And it's the thing that Lewis is talking about. That's the thing that these photos are trying to convey, that there's this distant longing for something more, for something real, for something great. And it shows up everywhere in our lives, so much so that we're we're just used to it. We don't even notice. So what's the thing behind the thing? If it's not the high of drugs, and if it's not the bliss of human achievement, and if it's not the beauty of travel or art or great food or great music or whatever it is, what is that thing behind the thing that all those things in their own way point towards? Well, what I'd like to submit to you is that according to the Bible, the thing behind the thing is this thing called the glory of God, which I know sounds like a really churchy answer. You're at church, so don't be that surprised, but it's actually, if you'll stay with me for a moment, it's actually incredibly good news. In verse three of Isaiah chapter six, as this vision unfolds, he sees this community of creatures declaring that the whole earth is full of the glory of God. It's this glimpse of what happens when God's creation is actually able to get a glimpse of the thing behind the thing. That there's true worship, that there's true celebration, that there's true restoration and atonement and that true life is found when we catch a vision for God's glory. So what is the glory of God? It's a word we use a lot at church, and we see sometimes in the Bible or sing in our hymns or Christmas songs. The Hebrew word is kavod. Glory means, or kavod is what we translate as glory. Literally, the Hebrew word kavod means what? Anybody know? Heavy. It has to do with weight. So there's some times in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, where the authors use the word kavod to simply describe the physical mass of something. For it to have lots of kavod is to be heavy or to be weighty. So in Judges 3, there's this crazy spy story about Ehud, the left-handed assassin. You'll have to go read the story. We skipped it in our Judges series a couple months ago. And he sneaks into this king's uh, throne room, and he stabs this king, and his dagger goes so far into the king's belly that the king's fat closes up on it. And what the author of Judges 3 tells us is that this king, Eglon, is kavod kavod, In your Bible, it's translated very fat. (laughs) Okay, so for those of us that have a little extra kavod, it's biblical, (laughs) and it's our glory. In English, we use the word heavy in non-literal ways all the time, don't we? Right? We We know what it feels like to receive really heavy news. We're using metaphorical language, but something of substance, something that matters, something that's going to change us or change things, that's super heavy. Or we, or we use the language of, I don't know if they've really grasped the gravity of that situation, right? They haven't really wrestled with its weightiness or its significance, Or even just in really casual conversation, we'll say, that's so huge. That's great. This is huge news, right? It's it's metaphorical language to say, this is a big deal. This is weighty. This is heavy. This is glorious. This is significant. This matters, okay? And so uh, I was watching football this weekend, yesterday, um, looking for some glory in the beavers, and it's just not happening. Uh, Disappointed, as always, but at one point, the commentator was talking about a certain player on the field and said, this guy has no field presence. And what he meant is that when that player's out there, you wouldn't even know it. And if he wasn't out there, you wouldn't miss him at all. 
Like his presence on the field does not matter. There's no substance, there's no weight, there's no glory to his presence. So Isaiah is giving us a vision of God that is just the opposite of that. Isaiah encounters this majestically beautiful, holy, in control, in command God. High, exalted, weighty, present. You can't miss him. So maybe you've seen a performance, maybe in athletics, but probably more likely on a screen or in a concert, at a play, when somebody has such a powerful, commanding presence that you can't look away. Like the whole theater could be on fire and you wouldn't notice because you're watching that person sing that song or play that part or do that thing, right? We call that like stage presence. Actors have stages, athletes have fields, but what about God? What's his stage? Well, verse three tells us that the whole earth is full of his glory. All of creation, everything in this world is the theater of the glory of God. It's the place where his presence is made known, where his presence matters and there's this undeniable uh, weight or, or sense of presence that you can't look away from. And so then in this theater of Isaiah's vision, all these weird animals are talking to each other and they're singing to one another, to one another. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Let me pause on that just for a quick moment. We understand that when we gather for worship on Sundays, oftentimes what we're doing when we sing is talking to God, right? And praising him and praying through songs and poetry and music. God, you are great. God, you are good. What a, what a wonderful name, right? But, and that's good. We should do that. But look, look what happens when these creatures get together and get a gl- glimpse of God's glory. They call out to one another, verse three. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So they're saying, look at that. Dude, look at him. Did you see that? They're describing for one another the vision of God that they've received. So part of what we do when we gather here on Sundays is yes, to sing songs directly to God that praise him and honor his name and give him glory. But part of what we're doing is talking and singing to one another reminding each other how good, how gracious, how loving our God is. You can't podcast that. That takes a community of worshipers to come together and encourage one another to call our attention and our focus to the beauty of God. And so over and over, they're claiming, saying to each other, holy, 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 the earth is full of his glory, meaning there is nothing in all of creation, in all of life, in all of experience that does not reflect God in some way. It's all his glory. The whole earth is his stage. In Psalm 19, The writer famously gives us these words of prayer and worship. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, God's fingerprints are on everything. We can't ignore it. We can't deny it. We can't escape the presence of God. The world is crowded with him. And we live in a part of the world where we get to experience this every single day in one way or another. Mountains, hills, rivers, streams, stars, planets, animals, fish, birds, fruits, vegetables, 
everything that God has made, it all speaks of his glory. But it isn't just limited to his creation. He created all this other stuff too, like not just the created elements, but the capacity for us to experience him through language and art and music and logic and sex and laughter and emotions and food and wine and community and all the best stuff, the whole earth is full of his glory. And then he creates us as his image bearers in his image and likeness to represent his glory to each other and to the world. And so he gives us this capacity to create as well and this mandate to steward the world that he's made for the sake of his glory. And so we build houses and we make paintings and we raise kids and we cook meals and we run companies and we lead governments and we build websites and we play sports and we ask questions and we have fun. And every person, every place, everything exists for the glory of God. Life's amazing. The world is beautiful. It's all his and for him. And his fingerprints are everywhere. But if you remember what Lewis is calling us to, is not to seek the fulfillment of the thing behind the thing within those things themselves. Or in other words, if we can see and celebrate his fingerprints everywhere, but we miss the hand behind it, then we'll turn all that wonderful, beautiful, amazing stuff into dumb idols that'll break our hearts. Things that will wow us for a while, but eventually will disappoint us. So this is, in a lot of ways, what the Bible means when it talks about sin. Sin isn't just doing bad things, right? But sin happens when we take the stuff that God has made and we turn it into God. When we look to the things God has created to be what only God can be for us. Good things like money, like pleasure, like fun, and power, and family, and education, and intimacy, and marriage, and self-expression, all this good stuff, and we elevate it to God's place. We pursue it as if it were the thing behind the thing. That's called worship, by the way, and it leaves us heartbroken. And so that's what glory is. God's glory is his weight, his significance, his identity as the one behind it all, the thing behind the thing, the only one that can satisfy our longing hearts. This another thing that this passage does for us, and that shows us what happens when we catch a glimpse of God's glory. So what does God's glory do for us? In verse five, there's an interesting thing. Isaiah starts that chunk by crying out, woe to me. So as he catches a glimpse of the glory of God, he, he is immediately made ultra aware of his own shortcomings. He's convicted of his sin. He's awakened to the fact that he's been missing the point that he's been worshiping people, places, and things other than God. Now, it's interesting, if you turn a page back in your Bible, if you're still in Isaiah, throughout chapter five, Isaiah is issuing this prophecy of woes and judgments, and six times in chapter five, Isaiah pronounces woe, which, by the way, we don't really do this very often. Maybe we should. It's kind of like epic language to say woe to you. Um, so if you have the opportunity this week, I, uh, at least let me know how it, how it goes. Um, look in, in chapter 5, verse 8. I'll just run through a few of these and read the verses. Woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. So who's he pronouncing woe on? The greedy, the power hungry, those that are never satisfied with enough. Verse 14, or verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning, 
to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night until they are inflamed with wine. Who's he pronouncing woe upon? The pleasure-seeking, the people that are constantly looking for the next thrill or wow or high or escape and are always disappointed. Verse 18, woe to those who draw sin along with cords of deceit and wickedness as with cart ropes. To those who say, let God hurry, let him hasten his work so that we may see it. The plan of the Holy One of Israel, let it approach so that, let it come into view so that we may know it. Those that are seeking knowledge, those that are seeking power, and think that if they get the right information, the right education, the right answers, that they'll have everything. Verse 20, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, and who put darkness for light and, and light for darkness, and who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Those who are doing it wrong, who are chasing pleasure and power and wealth, in these evil and corrupt and unjust ways. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Verse 22, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks, who acquit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. Okay, so on and on, these six woes of Isaiah chapter five give us this picture of these people that are pursuing glory in all the wrong places. Those that are chasing wealth, chasing power, chasing pleasure or knowledge or escape. And he's saying, don't you see what's wrong with the world? None of those things are the thing behind the thing. So in biblical uh, literature, numbers mean something, represent something. The fact that there's six woes would leave some of Isaiah's original hearers going, feels like something's incomplete. So when we turn the page then to Isaiah chapter six, verse five, he says, and woe to me. The seventh and final woe. He begins to see in the face of God's glory that the problem with the world isn't just out there and people like that. He's going, the problem is in here and people like me too. That I also am among those that have been looking for glory in the wrong places. So he sees himself as a sinner. He sees himself as, as someone in need. He sees himself as someone incomplete. And so when we catch a glimpse for the glory of God, we grow in the knowledge of his holiness. We also grow in the knowledge of our own sinfulness. We also become aware of how misplaced our allegiance or our loyalty or our affections have been throughout life. So what good does that do, anyone? Where's the hope in that? And in fact, that sounds like the kind of condemning religion that many of us are trying to get away from this really sour, negative view of humanity, what good does that do? Well, the reality is that only when we see how flawed our endeavors and our affections have been that we actually begin to get hungry for true redemption, for true fulfillment, and for true glory. So Tim Keller famously says, we have a gospel that shows us that we're more sinful and flawed than we'd ever da dare imagine. And we are more loved and accepted than we'd ever dare hope. In verse six, this flying creature goes to the altar, gets a coal, and then in verse seven, brings it to Isaiah and rubs it on his mouth. We're gonna do that right now. The ushers have some coal. We've got some weird flying things. I don't know. I don't know. It's a vision, all right? Ask Ken about that one. Where does the coal come from? Well, it does come from this altar. What do altars do? In the story of God in ancient Israel, well, the altar is the place where animals are sacrificed before God as an offering of worship. 
as a confession of sin and as an opportunity to receive forgiveness and to be atoned, to be made one with God again. And so in the presence of the holiness of God, catching a glimpse of the glory of God, Isaiah is convicted of his sin, is made aware that he's been looking for glory in all the wrong places and has elevated creation to the place of creator. He comes to a point of confession and repentance and he receives forgiveness. His guilt is taken away and his sin is atoned for. So as we've been in this journey through the Reformation, we've referred constantly to the 95 Theses that Luther nailed to the church door in Wittenberg. And uh, the first one of those 95 Theses is one of the most famous. And what it says is this, that when our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said repent, he intended that the entire life of the believer should be one of repentance. That's how Luther starts this whole conversation that changed the world. By proclaiming that repentance isn't just something that we do once in order to get saved, but it's actually the whole posture of the relationship that humanity has before God forever that the entire life of believers should be repentance. This idea of naming the things that we worship in God's place, the glory that we seek in place of God's glory, identifying those things, and acknowledging before God that I've, I've been an idolater. I've worshiped a God other than you. And I want to turn and come to you and kneel before you and bow before you and submit my life to you and to you alone to live for your glory and your glory alone. And so this is our continual posture that the gospel calls us into. And this is the journey that we'll find ourselves in really probably for the rest of our lives. And God in his gracious love not allowing our hearts to be satisfied by anything other than himself. Which, yeah, at times means life's gonna be hard and disappointing, and the things you thought were gonna be the things are gonna turn out to not be the things at all. But that's how much God loves us. That he won't let our hearts be satisfied by anything other than him. So when we need to encounter the glory of God, it'd be nice if we could say, okay, God, I want to have a vision like Isaiah. Cue the flying things and let's, let's do this, right? Because I need to be reminded who you are. I need to catch that vision. I want to be refocused on who you are in your glory. We don't really get that privilege very often. What do we have, though? Something even better. We have the ultimate revelation of God's glory in the person of Jesus. Listen to how Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, For God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. When we look at Jesus, we are seeing the radiance of God's glory. This is part of what we do every Sunday when we gather here to worship God. It's to look into the face of Christ in the faces of those around us. To look into the face of Christ in the revelation of God's word. To look into the face of Christ through receiving the bread and the cup in communion. To look into the face of Christ in relationships marked by prayer and love and generosity. We need each other to constantly remind one another to look to Jesus. Find your identity in Jesus. Find your hope in Jesus. One last thing. Verse 8, at the end of this whole thing, 
He says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. So what's interesting is that when Isaiah has this experience of glimpsing the glory of God, becoming aware of his own sin and shortcomings, but then receiving this incredible gift of mercy and restoration and salvation, he becomes part of what God is doing in the world. God's saying, I want my life not just to flow into you, but I want my life to flow through you. I I don't want you just to be the recipient of my grace, but I want you to actually be agents of my grace, he would say to his people. So Isaiah becomes the mouth of God, that very thing that he had moments earlier said was unclean and unworthy, that's touched by the coal, that's forgiven of its sin. Now his mouth becomes the thing that God uses to spread his glory to the world. And so when we catch a glimpse of God's glory, when we understand that we are reconciled to him by Christ alone, through grace alone, by faith alone, then all of a sudden, this whole thing begins to take on a huge new layer of meaning that we start being able to recognize and to celebrate and to participate in and to call forth the glory of God in all people, in all places, and in all things. This is one of the most beautiful things that came out of the Reformation. Prior to the Reformation, the dominant thought among the Christians was that only those in traditional ministry positions had vocations, And when I say vocations, I mean calling. God called some people to be pastors or evangelists or missionaries or things like that. But but after the rollout of the Reformation, the view of calling was expanded exponentially. That yeah, God does call some to be pastors and evangelists and missionaries, but he also calls some to be baristas and some to be software developers, and some to be moms, and some to be construction workers, and some to be comedians, and so, and on and on and on. That all of a sudden, all of life is an opportunity to participate in and to display the glory of God. Walking through the Luther House last month in Wittenberg and seeing one of the quotes on the wall, I think I have it for you. Um, he simply says this, believe in Christ and do whatever needs to be done in your profession. I guess I don't have that. Believe in Christ and do whatever needs to be done in your profession. That's his instruction on here's how to live in light of the glory of God or to the glory of God alone. We, I think Ken mentioned several weeks ago that, that Bach famously ends each of his musical pieces with S-D-G. Soli Deo Gloria. Which is beautiful, even more significant when you realize that just like today, back then, you would typically end your work, your writing, your music, whatever it was, with your own initials. But instead of Johann Sebastian Bach, he writes S-D-G. To the glory of of God alone, hoping that his music, when it was played, would point performers and listeners towards the glory of God. And so as we kind of begin to wind out of this Reformation series, and maybe for those that have been going, I I get the history and the theological significance, but are looking for a few more pieces of like, what does this mean for my life today? It means that your work matters to God. And it means that whatever it is that you find yourself doing, as Paul would say, whether you eat or drink, whether you build houses or raise kids or design websites or plant potatoes or whatever people in Ben do, right? Do it all for the glory of God. Your work matters. Every day matters. Every day is an opportunity to live in tune with the beauty, the majesty, the holiness, and the wonder of the world that God has made. Not elevating those things to the place of God, but enjoying them as those gathered around his throne. So we'll invite you to come to the table this morning.
to look into the face of Jesus, to receive his grace again by faith alone. The one thing we do in this whole dance of salvation and reconciliation is faith alone. It means the only thing we bring is nothing, right? It's like when somebody invites you over for dinner and you say, what can I bring? And they say, your appetite? That's this invitation as well. We come with empty hands with nothing to offer. We can take no credit for our salvation and our standing with God. It's all a gift. It's all grace. And uh, he invites us to gather around his presence again this morning, to receive life from him, and to go as those, just like Isaiah, that would say, here we are, send us, use us, commission us in all the millions of different creative, crazy ways that we may display your glory in the world. Will you stand and pray with me? Our Father, we are so thankful that though maybe we won't have the vibrant visions that somebody like Isaiah may have had, that we have an even clearer picture of who you are in your glory in the face of Jesus. We thank you that in your great love, you have come to us, you have wrapped yourself in humanity, become one of us and lived amongst us, lived and died in our place and raised from the dead and given us your spirit to be your people in this world. We are so grateful for this life that you've given us in you. We're grateful for all the glimpses of your glory, for the moments of joy, for the moments of life, for the moments of awe and wonder. And we're also so thankful for your ongoing commitment to not let us find true joy in anything or anyone other than you. So we pray, Holy Spirit, that you would continue this work that you've started in us opening our eyes to the glory of God, convicting us of our sin and our need for a savior, not just to enter into salvation, but to live in it forever. And thank you that you have done everything necessary in order to restore us into a right relationship with you. And so we come to you this morning with open hands. All we're bringing is our appetite, saying thank you, thank you, thank you. To your glory alone, in Jesus' name.